Okay, in this lecture, uh, what I want to talk about is time temperature superposition. Um, thus far uh, in all of our lectures, we've focused uh, exclusively on time, uh, with the exception of that very first lecture where we talked about uh, viscoelastic behavior and showed that uh, rate effects and temperature effects actually could, could um, cause the same type of behavior. Um, now we want to talk a little bit about how to incorporate temperature into some of the um, viscoelastic principles that we've already talked about. So let me just uh, remind you that initially, um, in our discussion of uh, viscoelastic materials, uh, we said in the following, right? We said that uh, mechanical behavior uh, of a viscoelastic material depended on two quantities. Okay, and the first quantity uh, was it depends on stress or strain rate. Okay, so stress or strain rate. Um, and right, those were variables like sigma dot and epsilon dot. And we've developed all of our equations basically in terms of these quantities. But we also said that the viscoelastic behavior of a particular material would depend on temperature, and which we've thus far ignored. We've implicitly assumed that um, that uh, whatever temperature we are characterizing, let's say our relaxation modulus or our creep compliance set, we're implicitly assuming that that uh, temperature is the same temperature that the the material is going to be used in practice, or that the t and that the temperature is constant. Okay. So what else did we we show at that initial in that initial uh, discussion of viscoelasticity? Uh, we also showed right that um, that uh, uh, that an increasing uh, strain rate or stress rate, okay, increasing st uh, stress or strain rate, what did that have the same effect as? Well, it had the same effect as uh, decreasing the temperature, okay? So we might think that there's some way we could uh, do some scaling so that we, we can characterize at a single temperature and then maybe um, adapt that characterization on the basis of temperature without having to just characterize the material for all temperatures, okay? So the question is, uh, we focused uh, on uh, stress rate and strain rate effects. Uh, how can we include temperature? Right, that's what we want to answer today. So here's the, here's the challenge, uh, two challenges that I want to be able to answer at the end of this lecture, okay? So Here's some challenges. Okay, number one. Well, let's say we characterize in a lab, uh, and let's say we characterize uh, the relaxation modulus uh, and or the creep compliance, let's say J of T, uh, in the lab, right? Uh, but, uh, but use in a different temperature. Okay, and the second challenge is a little bit more complex. Let's suppose that in whatever the in situ application of the material is, that the, that the temperature is not constant, right? It varies with time. So that's the second challenge. The in situ application uh, has a, a varying temperature, right? So that means that we have T now as a function of time, okay? How does that uh, how, how do we account for the changes in mechanical response to that? So let's go ahead at first and consider the first challenge, okay? So let's consider the first uh, challenge. So that's we want to characterize uh, y of t or j of t and then use at a different temperature. And I'm going to say that's a constant temperature. So because it's a constant temperature that we're using, even though it's different, um, uh, it's not really addressing uh, two at this time. So how can we account for this? Well, let me give you a, a little example uh, just to show you some, some curves and how um, temperature affects both um, relaxation modulus and creep compliance. So here's an example from an old paper back in 1961 uh, or two, I believe. So here's an example of uh, viscoelastic properties 
a, a, an epoxy resin at different temperatures. Okay. Okay, so what you're looking at here, they're, they're using the variable D uh, to describe the creep compliance instead of what we've been talking about, which is J. Uh, and what they're showing you is the creep compliance here at different temperatures. So uh, let's, let's uh, see if it makes sense. So obviously, uh, this looks like it goes down from 25 degrees uh, to 75 to 80 degrees, 85, 90, 100 degrees, right? So uh, in this direction... This is increasing temperature. Okay, let's see if that makes sense. So remember a creep compliance test, we're, we're fixing the, the stress that we put on it. So we apply roughly an instantaneous stress and we measure the strain response. Does it make sense that we would get a larger strain response at higher temperatures? Well, yes it does. And it also suggests that um, the, the higher the temperature, the, the um, more the strain is gonna climb, right? If we think about um, uh, uh, putting something in liquid nitrogen, we think of it as very brittle. The strain isn't going to um, uh, change much at all. And so uh, what we see here is consistent with, with our intuition. So we uh, have an increasing uh, uh, temp temperature that gives us the, the behavior that we would expect. And it's pretty significant, right? Um, order of magnitude change over maybe 20 degrees C. So something that we want to be certainly aware of going forward. Okay, and what I'm showing you now in this, this second plot is the relaxation modulus. They're calling it E instead of the Y that we used. So here's our increasing uh, temperature. Okay, so the question is, does that make sense? Well, um, what, what it suggests is that as we increase the temperature, the, the relaxation modulus decreases, right, which is what we expect for the polymer. Obviously, if we heat it up enough, we'll, we'll melt the thing and it'll have a very low modulus, right? So um, both of these fit our, our, antici our, our anticipated uh, behaviors. The one thing I want to call your attention to on both curves, however, is, is this curve here and this curve here, right? What those represent uh, are master curves. So there, in this paper that that uh, that I pulled these figures from, they end up actually using um, a, a uh, what's called the time temperature superposition principle, which we're going to talk about, to be able to collapse all of these behaviors onto a single master curve. Okay, so these are master curves that contains all of the data. So what it suggests is that there may be a simple way to account for temperature uh, without having to test at every temperature. Maybe we can just characterize some some simple uh, mapping. OK, and that's what we want to talk about today. OK, so obviously there's a brute force approach to the problem. So the brute force approach uh, would say uh, uh, just simply test for uh, as many uh, time and temperature behaviors as you can. So. Um, so develop um, empirically uh, a, a model of the form, let's say for a relaxation modulus, you'd say that y is now a function not only of t but of temperature, right? Let's call that equation 1. And you're just going to test um, extensively to get the functional form, okay? so. You're going to test extensively to get the functional form or a functional form. Okay, now there's nothing wrong with this. And in fact, in order to be able to do uh, what what this um, the authors here in this 1962 paper were doing is they had to do all this uh, testing so that they could prove that a master curve existed. But um, for our purposes, we are at least for for certain classes of materials can assume that curve exists and just look for uh, the mapping that we need. OK, so this is not uh, what I'm going to present here is not a theoretical derivation. It's a it came from originally an empirical observation that's at least backed up theoretically with what we know about polymers. But I'm not going to go uh, into the uh, sort of the, the kinetics of polymer behavior uh, in, in this class. OK, so let's just say that experimental results have shown that for a, uh, what are called um, thermorheologically simple materials, that's a long word, so thermorheologically simple, 
Okay. Materials. The effects of temperature can be accounted for with a single parameter. Okay, can be accounted for with a single parameter. Uh, and this is going to be via what's called the time temperature superposition principle. Okay, so the, the time uh, temperature superposition principle. So what, what does the time temperature superposition principle say? It basically says that changes in temperature can be accounted for by appropriately scaling the time. Okay, so this says that changes in temperature uh, can be accounted for uh, by appropriately scaling the time. Okay, and that's to be expected, right? So what are we saying? We're saying that the behavior, and, and we've, we've talked about this before, but the behavior, right, at some low uh, temperature and low strain rate, right, uh, is similar, right, to the behavior uh, at a high temperature and high strain rate. So, we just need to figure out how how to represent that and what's the what's the mathematical form that we're going to use to to incorporate this. So I'll just say that according to this principle, and I'm going to present this without derivation. I'll just I'll give you the the principle. So so according to this principle, the following relation exists. Okay. So and I'm just going to right now do it for the relaxation modulus, but it could equivalently be. Uh, done for the the creep compliance. Okay, so we're going to say that y uh, at the temperature of interest and the time of interest can be given by y at the reference temperature, some reference temperature, and c, which is our reduced time. This is a different c than what we had in our hereditary integral uh, term. This is this is uh, the re reduced time. Okay, so let's go ahead and call this equation two. Uh, so T naught is the reference temperature, right? And and this might be uh, something as simple as um, the the temperature that you did your test set in the lab, okay? And C is what's called the reduced time. So now we need to uh, say how how is that reduced time calculated? So the reduced time. Um, C is given by C is going to be equal to <clears throat> T divided by this quantity A of T, which is a function of temperature. Okay, this A of sub T term that's called the the temperature shift factor. Okay, let's call this equation three. So then the question becomes, what is this temperature shift factor? Right? And I'll tell you the typical form for it. Okay? So the typical uh, function for the shift factor uh, comes from the williams landel ferry model, which we'll typically just call the, the WLF model. Okay? You'll see that more frequently used. Okay, and it has a form that says that the log base 10 of the temperature shift factor A sub T, uh, which I will remind you is a function of temperature, is equal to log base 10 of uh, T over C, which is equal to, and this is, the, this is an empirical form that looks like negative C1 times uh, T minus T naught divided by C2 plus T minus T naught. Okay? Let's go ahead and call that equation 4. In equation 4, I'll just say where uh, C1 and C2 are material constants that you just look up in a table. 
uh, and uh, T naught is the reference temperature. Okay, and obviously uh, T is the temperature of interest. Okay? So that actually uh, completed our answer to the first challenge. So if we have a, a different temperature that we're applying our, uh, that, we're, that we're putting our material in, but we have a characterization at some reference temperature, we can adapt our, uh, our viscoelastic prediction for that temperature using this uh, methodology. It didn't answer the second challenge, which is that what happens when the temperature itself is changing in time. So it's not um, necessarily constant, okay? So let's just note that it says the above method uh, addresses uh, shifting for a constant temperature. Uh, what about uh, when the temperature is a function of time itself? Okay. So this is that second challenge that we talked about. So in this case, um, it's actually a pretty straightforward procedure. We can still use equations 2 and 4. So in this case, equations 2 and 4 are still valid. Right? The only thing we need now is we need a, a reduced time that, that, uh, that varies with time. Okay? Uh, so, but, uh, but in this case, the reduced time now, which was equation 3, the reduced time becomes uh, C as a function of time now is equal to, you're going to love this, the integral from 0 to T, so it has kind of the look of a hereditary integral, of now D tau, which is your just integration variable, over A T, which is equation 4. Now it's T tau, something like that. Okay, call that equation 5. So if we have a, uh, a time varying temperature, then we need to use equation 5 to compute the reduced time. Uh, otherwise, we could use equation 3, and we can, also, we can always use equations 2 and 4. Um, so that's the method that we use to, uh, to um, incorporate temperature uh, into, into our uh, viscoelastic behavior.